Uh, Malta's doing it again. Hello, and welcome to the Euro What, episode 205, dropping on September 12th, 2023. We are a pair of Americans trying to make sense of the Eurovision Song Contest. I'm Ben Smith, and I'm here with my co-host, Mike McComb. Hey, Mike. Hey, Ben. In this episode, we'll be sorting through our first batch of Eurovision 2024 headlines. The new year is here, Mike. So many press releases have dropped. Yes, I'm so glad that we didn't try to do a news one right at the beginning of uh, (laughs) (laughs) Eurovision New Year. Like there was news that dropped the day after our last episode went live and be like, ha ha, we tricked you. So... (laughs) Exactly. At this point, we figured out that the recording process for our show appears to be the catalyst for news happening the day afterwards. So we just Mm -hmm. tricked the Eurovision news machine into doing things when we are ready for them. If you're listening to this the day it drops, uh, get excited for whatever happens tomorrow. Yeah, it's (laughs) the last time we we had an episode, literally the next day, Belgium's like, hello, we have our artist. Belgium's national broadcasters take turns. It is time for their French language broadcaster to do this. And RTBF has selected Moosty who notably is a judge on Drag Race Belgique. Well, I'm sad that we won't get Eurosong this year, which makes sense because, like as you said, they swap broadcasters. I think this is a step on the same trajectory as Gustav. RTBF not, not following in the footsteps of their co-broadcaster, but definitely looking at what they did this year and going, oh, hey, that did pretty well. Maybe we should do some more of that, which not a bad plan because, again, Gustav was, was a delight brought a lot of light wherever he went in Liverpool. As far as details, the song will be revealed in February, and we have been promised Pop with a Dark Edge. I listened to what's on uh, Musti's catalog on Spotify uh, after the announcement. That's a good description of it, Pop with a Dark Edge. And I'm also really intrigued by the Drag Race connection, just because like I've dropped Drag Race a couple of years ago, but uh, my understanding is all of the international versions are available to watch everywhere. I think that's a really good way to kind of tap into potential international fandoms pretty early on. Exactly. And it means that even though they are dropping this news at the tail end of August 2023, they they don't have to completely reintroduce him by the time that February 2024 rolls around. I was delighted when all of the press releases dropped because as a recent graduate of Duolingo Finnish, Musti uh, pops up in a bunch of the first lessons as the name of a dog. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Musti on Kilti Koira. He's a good dog. Uh, j- oh. And just because Musti is just sort of like an affectionate version of the, the Finnish word for black. So just like a black dog is often named Musti. Oh, yeah. That's fun. Yeah, yeah that's very fun. <laughs> Sounds like a lot of meme potential for some reason. Ex- uh. Exactly. Just like, I have so many Duolingo screenshots ready to go for next February. It was also announced on Monday that Sweden is adding to their production team. They have picked up Christer Bjorkman and Per Blinkens to help out with things in May. Just in case we were worried, we've got some old hands behind the reins. And like I did just say last episode that I do feel like Christer has been good for Eurovision as a whole. I'm really getting the sense that Sweden is just like, nope, we just want this to be as efficient and easy as possible. Like, we're not going to do anything too new uh, to the process. It's like, well-oiled machine. Let's just get this out the door. I think Kreister will definitely be able to deliver on that. (laughs) I did like the little note in the story that he's still pursuing a Latin American Eurovision adaptation. Like, he's not giving up that dream, even though uh, North America seemed to say no. I I feel like that is the most viable option like i mean we, we talked about uh like that festival that's down in chile at the vina del mar and i think there is the juice behind that <laughs> that needs to exist that just doesn't quite exist in the u.s yeah there's like a natural desire of like hey we're, we like doing this <laughs> I feel like the U.S. just did not have. The other person on the team, Per Blankens, he has a pretty good resume as well. He's worked on Melfest. He did a lot of work on American Idol and also a show from China called The Next. And I had to double check to see if that was the one that Jesse J won. But uh, no, that was a different show. So (laughs) I did appreciate immediately seeing that in the notes that no, this is not the one that Jesse J won. That is the singer. In a separate interview, Per mentioned that cutting down the runtime of the show is still high on the priority list. It wasn't just sort of a fleeting thought uh, the last time that we talked about it. It's like, oh, no, they, they're serious about this, and I'm very eager to see how that plays out. 
Yeah, I think in that same interview, like another thing that's been going around is like Sweden's going to bring in a second chance round, and just Christer and and Pear just immediately took. We don't know what you're talking about. We are here to provide the smoothest Eurovision possible. I think after the kerfuffle with the way that they were originally thinking of doing the results for this year's contest, any sort of change like that, it's like, oh, no, that's going to have to go through committee a couple of times. Like, I I, I could see them maybe trying to introduce that. At, well, no, they can't even do that at Junior Eurovision because that's not a multi-stage thing. That's just like a one and done. Yeah, no, it's, it's like Sweden is like, y'all can try that. We are going to have normal Eurovision. We are going to have a nice family Christmas if it kills all of us. Yes. <laughs> so far, in terms of who's RSVP'd for the big family Christmas, we have 29 countries that have confirmed. Uh, it's still going to be a couple of weeks before we get that final roster. Uh, so probably somewhere in the mid to upper 30s, I'm yeah, guessing. I, yeah, I'm leaning towards like mid upper 30s. There are, there are some people going around that were like, if everybody, if everybody who could make it came, we'd have like 40 or 41 and that's including Monaco, because Monaco now has a broadcaster that can qualify for, for EBU again. But I feel like they're not going to all of a sudden just like pop into the mix. But I feel like we could get like North Macedonia back. We could get uh, Montenegro back, maybe. My concern is budgets are very tight right now. And mm -hmm. next year is the Olympics. And that's also going to be a big yeah, budget. Yeah, that's, a, that's so. another big budget thing. So maybe not for some of the ones that have been sitting out for budget reasons. Even though I would like to know what Bulgaria is up to. I'm not sure if there are entirely budget reasons, but um, we won't yeah. get into that right now. Yeah. But we do have a page on our website at yourwhat.com for the 2024 contest. We will have all that information updated as it comes in. We are in the season where the EBU reference group is going to be meeting, discussing various topics. And one of the things that it's currently debating banning the use of is AI-generated content at the, at the contest. I understand why that question has come up. I feel weird about EBU actually making that decision that really feels like something that should be handled by the individual broadcasters since they make the rules for what their entries are going to be anyway, like in terms of like what your citizenship is, uh, if you're allowed to have people from outside of the country participate in the songwriting or the performing or whatever. It just seems like how the song is generated would be would kind of fall into that category. Also, mm -hmm. I would really like a definition of what AI means here. yeah yes yeah as, as a person who who just uh accused sweden recently of being <laughs> of being the chat gpt of the contest uh I, yeah i'm just like what do you mean by that especially because i learned about this discussion through eurovois and there was a, a, the phrasing of the move follows discussions about the authenticity and human touch in performances after ai generated songs and acts made their mark in recent editions citation needed please explain that's the thing. If the song is created by an AI and it's like word salad, like <laughs> the way that a lot of generated text can be, somebody is going to have to perform that and it's going to have to be a convincing enough performance. Like it, like there's still a human component to the Eurovision presentation. Like somebody mm -hmm. has to be on stage. No more than six people can be on stage, but I think you have to have at least one person <laughs> on stage. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see what sort of decisions are made also it'll be interesting to see if ai is still a concern six months from now uh, yeah just, so. <laughs> like it's, it's yeah because like ai feels very buzzwordy in a way that like i feel like the second that the new hot topic comes up we're not gonna we're just be like what i'm glad they didn't take a stand on like nfts or bitcoin or anything like that <laughs> i mean they didn't so. have to because six months later none of us had them we had moved on to ai yeah next year's Winning song is going to be performed by bored apes. So, <laughs> <laughs> finally, a literal monkey's paw. Over on our Patreon, we want to thank our supporters. Uh, every little bit of support helps, and uh, yeah, we're really enjoying putting together these bonus episodes. Uh, our most recent one was about Abbott Gold. Our next one is going to be about the essay "Notes on Camp." Eurovision and camp, they usually appear in the same sentence. So <laughs> let's see, let's see how, how the definitions work. I'm looking forward to discussing that with you. I feel like I have many spheres of interests that border on campy, if not are called campy. And like, the, I'm, I'm enjoying what I'm reading. 
That episode is scheduled to drop uh, at the beginning of October, and you can find our full archive of bonus episodes, which you'll have access to if you become a Patreon supporter, uh, over at patreon.com slash eurowhat. Elsewhere in podcast space, I was on the Great American Pop Culture Quiz Show again recently in episode 11 of their current season, attempting to break my way out of the Gizmonic Institute division and make it to the final. So give that a listen. Very exciting episode. We will have a link to that in the show notes. September 1st is here. It has come and gone. And we are finally getting all of the delicious, delicious details of how national selections are happening next year. Starting out, we had like a little bit of early discussion kind of midsummer. I think the the big announcement has been that TAP Music was passing the baton back to the BBC for 2024 after a couple years of selections. They talked with the Eurotrip podcast about some of the details. And one of the things that dropped was that Ryo Sawayama, who was in a lot of discussion this year as being a potential UK entrant, was apparently approached and allegedly thought about it and got back to the team, but then like never heard back from them. Do I believe that she was contacted? Yes. I see why we were connecting all the dots because her most recent album came out last September after the September 1st date. So it worked out. There was a song that was three minutes that got very hyped up. But if you look at the sort of things that she was also doing, she's in the new John Wick movie that came out mid-March. The level of promo for that, plus then also the level of promo that Eurovision artists are now doing and sort of expected to do, along with developing a performance, thinking about the staging, rehearsing the staging, all that. Like, it just it doesn't add up to me that it was ever going to be a thing. It kind of reminds me of, I can't remember if it was TAP or BMG, where it's just like, Dua Lipa is part of this label. And it's like, yeah, it's not going to be Dua Lipa. (laughs) Try as you might. Yeah, whenever they throw that, it's like when a movie trailer is like, from the producers of blank. It's like, okay, but the producers are not the performer. It'd be great if she was interested. It's like, oh, well, keep her phone number. I'm still not sure that would have been the right fit, though, because Sam Ryder was at like the perfect bubble of fame where Eurovision was a great rocket boost to things where Rina Sawayama was. She's on the indier side of pop music, but she was a known quantity where it didn't feel like Eurovision didn't necessarily feel like the next step up. And I think that's a trap that the UK can kind of fall into where it's like, oh, well, we've got a name. We've got Bonnie Tyler. We've got uh, Engelbert Humperdinck. And granted, this is not the same situation where it's just like, oh, it's an act that was famous like 20 years prior doing a comeback. It's like... It's a very difficult needle There's a continuum. I feel just like there was like the constant complaint for many years with the UK. We could send Adele and she would come in last place. I'm like, yes, because that's not the right venue for Adele. In researching for the next episode, I think I found the like ground zero article of all of the UK (laughs) complaining. (laughs) So I'm trying to figure out how to actually work it in. That's a that's a fun teaser for next time. Other details that popped up, uh, Switzerland is going internal again. That seems to be working very well for them. Does not surprise me. Honestly, props to Malta for somehow making MESC even more complicated at this point. The details came out. I'm pretty sure you could have heard me scream from Chicago, Mike, when I read the when yeah. I read the news. <laughs> that's, that's what that noise was. It was me reading about what Malta is doing this year. They are doing like an extended semifinal phase where people are trying out. That could be starting as early as October. 12 acts from that are going to qualify and be invited to make a live to tape performance in December. They will also be given 5,000 euros to make a music video. And during the final of the multi selection, uh, instead of any live performances, they will be showing the live to tape and the music video. Why? It reminds me of Czechia's process from like, not, not the most recent one with ESCZ, mm-hmm. but like back in 2019, where they just had like the six entrants, and they all had an Airbnb, and they all had the opportunity to make a music video. And like, okay, yes. I think that online process, I think more countries should be adopting something like this. And this this one's different, since it is going to be more televised, and it's kind of working backwards. I think that's the thing that's so weird about this one, where it's just like, it feels like all of the elements are in reverse. Yeah, it's like, why not just do the, the Czechia process and just do it that way instead of, like, we do it, again, doing, like, the weird backwards version of, of that. Maybe they just need to fill TV programming time. I like the idea of there being some sort of consistency in what we're going to see in the performances. Because that, yeah. that, that, that was probably the most painful part <laughs> of last year's show, where it's just like... 
too many people and way too wide a spectrum of what to expect from that. I think my main fear was just when I read the press release, I'm like, just like, oh, no, they've made the entire program the last week of their endless process where it was just like a red carpet with the numbers you could now call (laughs) after six weeks of, of being shown performances. I think it also like really does a great job of sidestepping any potential technical difficulties and, again, possibly budget issues of trying to stage a live final because they do go all out for those live venue performances. There is something very nice and equalizing about, okay, everybody gets 5,000 euro. Everybody gets to make a live to tape performance in the same studio. We will, we will set the parameters of this challenge as equally as possible and see who, who excels from that. If anything, it'll be something to watch. So, Mm -hmm. (laughs) and we'll probably know right away if it's just going to be like, okay, this could be interesting or, uh, Malta's doing it again. So. Also, making moves is Cyprus. And yeah, their whole process has been a journey. And again, we are in early September. So, (laughs) just making moves just feels like an understatement with how much Cyprus stuff has happened in like the last month, month and a half. Yeah, and it's something where it's just like, okay, we're going to talk about this in the next news episode, and stuff just kept happening. So originally, Cyprus was going to use Fame Story as their selection method, which is like a sort of Fame Academy American Idol type thing. The plan was to produce the show in Greece, and it was going to debut on, I think it was Star TV, some Greek broadcaster. Not the Greek broadcaster for Eurovision, ERT, they were just like, um, hey guys, uh, what's going on here? Why are you hosting your national final in our country on a totally different broadcaster? So the EBU came back and was just like, yeah, if you're going to host a national final, you need to host it in your own country. <laughs> it needs uh, so to be hosted they, nationally. Yeah, Cyprus is like, all right, you know, we're just going to drop fame story Initially, they said that they were going to have some sort of national final thrown together uh, for January. Almost a week after that announcement came out, rumors started flying that they were going to pivot to an internal selection, possibly announce the artist in September. Just like, oh, well, that's a convenient change of plans. <laughs> so yeah. that might explain why they weren't so heartbroken about or put up, putting up much of a fight about the fame story thing. It's like, oh, yeah, we've we've got a plan B. They moved very quickly. <laughs> Yeah, they just, you said no, all right, next thing. So uh, good for them, I guess. Also doing it again will be Ukraine and their vidbeer process. Uh, They're not starting as early this time around. Their submission process will close in late October. They are going to have 10 finalists selected by November. And then from the long list that they're choosing from, the people who aren't selected will be put up for a wildcard vote. So there should be 11 finalists, but usually something hinky happens with Ukraine. So uh, watch this space for a final roster. The final for Vidbeer is scheduled for February 2024. And Germany also announced that they will be holding their national final on February 16th. Keeping an eye on streaming numbers, there's some interesting stuff happening. So Tattoo is still getting approximately a million plus streams a day, which shocks me. That feels like so many streams. One of my husband's friends was in Sweden recently and reported that you could hear Tattoo on the radio every hour. So um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's still definitely doing numbers in the home country. And uh, yeah, I actually checked the uh, Swedish top 40 and uh, I think it was ranked in 35. So it, it's still it's still up there. That has crossed 250 million streams. It's kind of closing in on sort of all-time ESC streaming numbers. Number five is Waterloo with 264 million. So it's getting close to that. It's definitely going to overtake Waterloo. Like, uh, yeah, trying to think of the math now. It's like, it may have already done that or it may happen later this week. Uh, It's going to happen soon. Uh, The top three at the moment are ZDE Buoni with 412 million, Snap with an impressive 750 million. Arcade has a billion streams. Well, yeah, and speaking of records breaking, uh, Karia's Cha 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 surpassed 100 million streams on August 11th, and it is the first song in the Finnish language to do that. The Finnish Music Publishers Association just had their annual awards, and it won both Export Achievement of the Year and Song of the Year awards. I love that name, Export Achievement. Knowing Finland, there's the whole notion of Torila, of, of just like, we have been mentioned in the news, everybody to the town square. Ah, okay. <laughs> The, anyways, the, the press release uh, said, The song has made Finnish music history by being the internationally most streamed song in the Finnish language. 
Karya phenomenon is one of the biggest phenomenons in Finland in 2023, and in the center of it is the song Cha Cha Cha, which as a song is insightful, fun, and long-lasting. I like the idea that they are quantifying phenomenons. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't know, like that particular phrasing, and granted, this is probably a translation uh, issue. But also, what are the other biggest phenomenons in Finland in 2023? I am intrigued. And like in other years as well. So <laughs> Yes. Yeah, just like, is there a Wikipedia page that I can spend too much time on? 2023 is the first contest to have three entries for past 100 million streams, uh, because Queen of Kings is also doing viral streaming numbers. We love to see it. What is Manskin doing? Monaskin will be performing at the MTV Video Music Awards, which are happening tonight as this episode drops. They were nominated for Best Rock Video for their single, The Loneliest. And it was also recently announced that they are nominated for Group of the Year. I've not actually looked at the other nominees, but I'm assuming if Blackpink or some other K-pop group is in there, that, uh, yeah, maybe not getting your hopes up for Just like <laughs> for, very, for very much, it's an honor to be nominated, but that is an army, and you cannot fight that. Every time I look at VMA news, I have to confront that time is passing and I'm aging because uh, Sam Ryder is also nominated, but for something called Push Performance of the Year. And I will. I decided that I don't need to know what that means. Huh? Aren't the Kens responsible for the push performance of the year? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Give it to them. But no, they, they. I believe that's some sort of like rising artist program on MTV when they're not playing episodes of ridiculousness. I don't know. It's just always ridiculousness when I check that out. I believe it's like a monthly series for so like a lot of nominees in that category. So. Uh, also, just in just like a fun bit of word salad, uh, Victoria from Monoskin is also a guest bass player for a cover of Psycho Killer on Duran Duran's new Halloween goth album. As much as I love that hodgepodge, that does sound like a really awesome cover. It just I'm... sounds like I had a bunch of bingo balls <laughs> with phrases on it, and I spun it around a few times and picked like four of them, doesn't it? I think I have bingo. That's going to do it for this episode of the Euro What. Thanks for listening. The Euro What podcast is hosted by Ben Smith. That's me and Mike McComb. That's me. If you'd like to help support the show and access a ton of bonus content, head on over to patreon.com slash eurowhat. Free access to our full archive of more than 200 episodes going all the way back to the 2018 contest can be found on our website, eurowhat.com. Next time on the Eurowhat, we dig into the relationship between Cyprus, Greece, and Eurovision, which is not a political contest. Drink.